Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this. The Durham County Council Planning Committee being held on Tuesday, the 6th of April 2021. On behalf of the members, may I welcome you all, that is the members of the County Council, the members of the public who are about to speak to our officers, and indeed the members of the public and press who will be watching this morning's meeting. My name is John Robinson. I am chair of the County Planning Committee. At this moment in time, the vice chairman has submitted his apologies so Councillor Ivan Jewell has kindly agreed to act as the vice chairman for this morning's committee. Um, that will come, it will clearly it shortly be explained a bit further. But if my connection actually goes down, Councillor Jewell will take over. Ladies and gentlemen, if you during the meeting would remain, put your microphones on mute unless you are speaking, that helps with the sound for everybody. And secondly, if you are, when you begin to speak, if you could give us your name and your position or what ward you represent, then the members of the public who are watching can identify you. Before you begin, may I please make two personal statements. Number one, on behalf of my family, may I, this is the only re chance I'm going to have because of the county council elections. On behalf of my family, may I thank every member of the county council and all the officers who have contacted me during these last three weeks at the loss of my wife. People say this word quite willingly, the word family, but when you get into a situation like I have, you create and find families all over. And I found the family and friendship from the members of Durham County Council particularly, and several of the officers outstanding and quite humbling. So on behalf of Stephen, Sharon and myself, thank you. And may I also thank you all for the support given to this committee over the last four years and wish every member who is standing, regardless of what party, the best in the election, because you do come to County Hall to represent the people of Durham, and that's the most important. So if we can now move on. Apologies, Mr Croft. Chair, we have apologies from councillors Corrigan, K, Leng, Richardson, Shield and Tinsley. And clearly, do we have any substitute members? Chair, Councillor Lynn Pounder, a substitute member for Councillor Audrey Lang. Good morning, Lynn, and thank you as always. We now move on to declarations of interest. Can I move on to the solicitor and take some legal advice? Claire, are you there? Yes, Chair. I think you know what the advice I'm about to ask. Um, I declare an, would normally declare an interest on this particular point because one of the speakers was the mayor of Durham when I was the mayor of Sedgefield. And in the past, I have always declared an interest. But at this moment in time, that person has not logged in. Would you think for that fairness, do you want me to still declare or can I continue? No, Chair, I think it would be appropriate for, for you to declare an interest given um, the nature of the, the interest and the fact that Mrs. Grimes is an objector. OK, so I declare an interest at this point on the grounds that I was the mayor of Setchfield Borough when Mrs. the lady in particular was the mayor of the city of Durham. We then move on to the minutes of the meeting held on the 20, the 2nd of March. Can we agree? Move on the chairman, John Shuttleworth. Thank you, Councillor Shuttleworth. Second, Councillor Ivan. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Joe. All those in favour? Thank, Thank you. you. Can I now hand over to, to Councillor Ivan Jewell, who's volunteered? Councillor Jewell has, throughout the whole process, actually stood in because Councillor Tinsley on a couple of occasions hasn't been available to, to do and chair the Millburn Gate House development. Thank you, Ivan, for agreeing to do this. Claire, I will now leave the meeting, disconnect and not rejoin. And then that makes it totally clear. Noted. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our remote meeting of the County Planning Committee. I am Councillor Ivan Jewell, uh, Chair of the North Area Planning Committee and Chair of this meeting for today. Please note that the meeting is being live streamed to the Council website and will be available for viewing for a minimum of six months. I'd like to give a warm welcome uh, to members, officers and any members of the public or media who are watching this live stream of the meeting. I would also like to extend warm welcome to members of the public who have registered to speak for this meeting. 
Before I commence with a few um, a few house rules, um, for those participating in the meeting, if you could only speak when invited to speak by myself, the chair. Please keep your microphone on mute at all times unless invited to speak. Uh, committee members, um, if you wish to speak, please type RTS request to speak in the chat function and that will indicate to me that you wish to speak. Once invited to speak, please introduce yourself with your name and your position unless you have already done so on a previous occasion. If I lose my connection, um, Councillor John Clay, who is chair of the South and West Area Plan Committee, will take over in my absence and until my connection is restored. Could I now, uh, I think it would be a good time for uh, maybe officers who are going to be a part of this meeting to introduce themselves. So can we start off with you, Henry? Thank you, Chair. My name is Henry Jones. I'm the Principal Planning Officer in the Strategic Planning Team and I'll be presenting the Melbourne Gate item today. And Andrew Inch. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, Andrew Inch, Strategic Development Manager. Thanks very much. And we have John McGargill. Thank you, Chair. John McGargill, I'm the Highways Development Manager. Thanks very much. And Claire? Thank you, Chair. Claire Cuskin, Legal Advisor to the Committee. Thank you, Claire. Is there any other officer who is going to be taking part in this morning's meeting that I've missed that isn't on screen? I'll take that as a no. So thanks very much for, to those who have introduced themselves. Um, can we sort of move straight into the business uh, of, the, of the, sorry? Can we move straight on to the business of the day, um, the application that we are, we are looking at today? And can I pass you over to Henry, please, for his presentation? Thank you, Chair. I'll just start uh, sharing the presentation now. It'll just take a moment to load up. OK, so the application before us today, it relates to the variation of four conditions on two planning permissions covering the Milburn Gate redevelopment. The purpose of these variations are to remove the requirement for and any reference to the signalisation of the proposed Framwell Gate Path Junction and also to agree the precise design of that junction. It's a site location plan, so the Milburn Gate redevelopment is actually covered by three main planning permissions. Um, the variation of conditions before us today relate to two of those. So the one um, bound with the, the red line that relates to the overall site um, and the permissions in place mainly for residential use, leisure use and food and drink uses across the site. The second permission is that bound with the green line and that principally relates to one block which is office dominated. This aerial photograph just shows the site in relation to its uh, surroundings. Um, members are probably quite familiar with this site now given it's um, um, a, a fairly major site and also it's been to, to committee in, in various guises several times now. So the Framelgate path um, access um, and road is located to the west of the site. Beyond that is the Highgate residential development. To the north is the Radisson Hotel and beyond that is the residential properties of Sidegate and Diamond Terrace. Um, to the east you have Framelgate Waterside and adjacent to that the River Weir and Freeman's Reach beyond. And to the south, you have Leeses Road and Melbourne Gate Bridge, and beyond that, the River Walk Shopping and Leisure Centre. Now, planning permission for the Melbourne Gate redevelopment was first granted uh, approximately three years ago, and this is a site layout from that original planning permission. 
and it shows the arrangement of the various building blocks across the development. Um, but it also shows the accesses which were established at that uh, original planning permission time. So the main access points uh, for customers who are visiting the food and drink and leisure use of the development will be taken from Framblegate Waterside um, and would enter into a multi-storey car park. That's taken from um, that Waterside Road, which is to the east of the, of the main building blocks. But the layout also clearly shows the access onto Framblegate Path, which was established at that time as well. Um, sorry, Anne. I'll I'll can try and reshare it in a different guy. So I'm just getting a query that some members can't see the presentation very well. Uh, what I can do, I can't zoom in on this, but if you bear with me a moment, I'll see if I can um, present it in a different format. Just bear with me a moment. Can members see that now? I'm fine with that. How about you, Mark? Councillor Wilkes? Much better, Chair. OK, right. OK, I'll, Thank I'll, you. Continue, I'll continue with this format. OK, so it shows the uh, Framelgate Path um, access shown uh, coming in on the, um, the, the uh, western side of, of, of that image. Um, that access was only approved for the purposes of the residential units within the development. Um, there was a proposed variation at one point in the past to open that up for general customers visiting the leisure uses, etc. However, that was actually withdrawn. So the purpose of this access that we're discussing today is for the uh, residential occupiers of, of the development. So. As part of that original planning permission, there were effectively three conditions which got applied to that planning permission, which dealt with the detail of the junction design, how it would operate, and also to agree the footway, which would also need to be amended as part of those works. And these conditions have been repeated uh, on various planning permissions ever since. So um, the first states, notwithstanding details contained within the plans and documents submitted, Work shall not commence on the provision of the proposed signalised junction on Framelgate Path until a detailed design has been submitted to and approved by the local planning authority. The design shall include details of any highway works at or within the vicinity of the entrance to egress from Highgate. The submitted details shall include timescales as to when the highway works and signalised junction provision shall be implemented. So it's proposed to vary this con condition so that there's no reference to the signalisation of the junction anymore and also to actually agree the suite of uh, detailed drawings for the design. The next condition states the development hereby approved shall not be occupied until details of an operational strategy for the proposed Framelgate Path signalised access junction has been submitted to and approved in writing by the local planning authority. Thereafter, the signalised junction shall be operated in accordance with the approved details. The purpose of this condition was to outline those measures which would ensure that it would only be for the residential occupiers of the development to use this access, be that, for example, using a FOB system. Um, that condition will, would still remain. It would just be tweaked to remove the references to signalised which come up in that condition. Finally, the third condition stated, notwithstanding details contained within the plans and documents, no development other than demolition, preliminary site ex excavation, enabling remedial work shall take place to a final scheme of pedestrian and cycling provision by means of a footpath, cycle path and any associated verges, landscaping enclosures on those sections of Framelgate Path and Leeses Road, Melbourne Gate Bridge, which are within the site boundary, has been submitted to and approved by the local planning authority. The details submitted shall include details on the timescale of the provision of the pedestrian and cycling provision. Thereafter, the pedestrian cycling provision shall be carried out in accordance with the approved details. 
So this condition effectively dealt with the um, revised footway, which would run up from Mulgate Path as a result of the junction and highways works, which are necessary. That condition's actually previously been approved uh, and discharged. So there's a there's a shared footway scheme akin to that shown on the plans, um, which I'll be presenting in a moment, which has previously been approved. These uh, next two slides just show the detail of the actual highways drawing submitted to depict the uh, the actual junction. So there's no longer proposed to be a signalised junction. We have a more simple priority junction arrangement. You can see it's it's a left in left out arrangement. So you would come southbound down from Gate Path and enter in left, and uh, the only egress would be a left to head southbound again on uh, Framelgate Path. Um, it's designed with a splitter island in the centre of the access junction um, that serves a couple of purposes. It firstly will um, help to prevent any right hand turn manoeuvres which are prohibited under this access arrangement. It would also provide a safety refuge for pedestrians and cyclists which are crossing the access. Also depicted on the drawings are the, is an element of um, carriageway widening, which was which is necessary to provide the access. There's uh, lining amendments. Um, the footway is shown there uh, towards the right hand side in the hatching. And there's also uh, various other highways works necessary, such as the signage, uh, lighting columns, service diversions, etc. This next uh, photograph, uh, uh, plan rather, just shows the more northern um, extent of, of the works up towards um, the side gate area. This is a site photograph uh, taken recently. So this is looking directly at the point on which the access would go into the development between those two uh, building blocks within the foreground of that picture. Um, if members are wondering what happens to, to the vehicles immediately upon entrance into it, they, they, you'll actually drop down into the multi-storey car park, which serves the entirety of the development, which uh, sits beneath all of these building blocks. You can clearly see on the um, photograph that the works have, have commenced as well. This second photograph, just to take from another angle, just uh, farther up the hill, just looking more, more northerly towards where the, the works commence on Framwell Gate Path. And the access point again is just shown to the front of that building block in the image. In terms of consultations and representations, um, the City of Durham Parish Council have registered to speak and, um, and will elaborate on their comments, but they object on the grounds of unsafe temporary pedestrian cycling provisions being in place and to the precise junction design with no physical uh, prohibition of right hand turns whilst a safer crossing design is required in their opinion. Um, the Highway Authority of Statutory Consultee, they have raised no objections. In terms of public responses, um, we've got a representative of the City of Durham Trust and Eileen Grimes here to speak today. Uh, but in summary of the comments received, the concerns are that there's an in inadequate footway width for safe pedestrian and cycle use, unsafe junction design with drivers attempting right hand turns likely, uh, details of how the junction will be used by residents only as required by the planning permission needs to be understood now and that the works have commenced in breach of the planning permission. Councillor Freeman also submitted comments requesting that the application be heard at planning committee with concerns that there's no physical prevention of a right hand turn, whilst the, the application uh, erroneously suggested the access could be utilised by non-residents. And the applicant has clarified since that that was just in error. So in summary, the principle of the Milburn Gate development is established including the provision of an access from Framwellgate Path to serve residents of the development and for emergency purposes if required. The need for carriageway widening and the provision of a shared pedestrian cycle footway adjacent to that has also previously been accepted both in principle and through a discharge of condition process as well. So the acceptability of these applications therefore rests on the precise junction design and the removal of the requirement for it for, to be signalised anymore. The Highway Authority considered the precise design and changed the priority junction arrangement to be safe and suitable. And officers overall conclude that the proposals are considered to accord with the relevant advice 
and policies in the County Durham Plan, the Durham City Neighbourhood Plan and the MPPF and approval is therefore recommended. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Henry. Um, we have a number of speakers this morning, um, so I will call upon Councillor Ashby um, to address the committee now, please. Um, Councillor um, Ashby is um, representing the City of Durham Parish Council, and so over to you, um, Councillor Ashby. Thank you, Chair. That's very kind, and good morning, committee. Um, the City of Durham Parish Council has uh, two main concerns. Um, the in inadequate signage for safe alternatives for pedestrians and cyclists encountering the temporary closure of the footpath, and secondly, the design of the new junction. The Parish Council in early February discussed with representatives of the company our concerns about inadequate warning signage that the pedestrian and cycling footpath was closed. They undertook to consider what improvements could be made in regard to signage. As far as I'm aware, nothing has changed. Uh, this first photograph shows that people who've walked down from the DLI car park and the new two-storey station car park are faced with no sign, no advice, no central refuge anymore, and so find themselves having to return all the way up to St Leonard's tra school traffic lights. Actually, uh, yesterday a sign has appeared uh, just where I stood to take that photograph. Uh, what a coincidence. Uh, the second photograph shows that you come to a dead end. There's no way of carrying on. There's no directions, no alternative safe route. Just the roadway where cars are in a squeezed space with no room for pedestrians. They can't now use the safety refuge in the middle of the road because the applicant removed it many weeks ago. I say all that to illustrate the rather cavalier attitude of the applicant towards pedestrians and cyclists' safety. They've also shown that attitude in removing the refuge and starting work on the new junction without planning permission. And this brings our second concern. The design of the junction now under construction does need to be improved and it does need to be restricted to residents and emergencies only. The junction design recognises that right-hand turns into or out of the site would be extremely hazardous and likely to cause collisions with traffic on Pramogate Peth. So any driver travelling up Pramogate Peth would be told by a notice to not attempt to turn right into the development and would be expected to instead drive up to the County Hall roundabout and there turn southwards and back down from a gate path to get to the entrance to the site. Uh, similarly, a driver exiting the site wanting to travel north up from a gate path would be told by a notice to not attempt to turn right and instead to turn left down to the complicated Milburn Gate roundabout and there turn northwards to be able to travel up from a gate path. However, there are just such notices for Highgate, but they are ignored often enough to cause a real hazard for motorists on Framlegate Peth who suddenly find a vehicle crossing their path. It's happened to me. So in order to prevent such dangerous manoeuvres, something more effective than a notice is necessary. A physical barrier of some kind, whether this be a narrow pedestrian refuge perhaps with railings, across the mouth of the junction, or perhaps bollards as exist elsewhere in the city, for example, outside County Hall. And I could also mention, of course, the temporary cycling routes that have been created. They have rows of bollards uh, taking up hardly any space, but making sure motorists don't cross. Um, provision for pedestrians and cyclists to safely pass across the junction is needed with ideally a raised roadway so as to be at level with the footpath. And this would have the additional benefit of acting as a traffic calming speed hump to slow cars down. Road markings to remind motorists of potential pedestrian or cyclists crossing their path should also be required. And the Highway Authority 
objects to this request, saying that it would cause a safety hazard as turning vehicles would have to slow down. But that's the whole point, to slow them down. The Parish Council's neighbourhood plan identifies safety issues with the current narrow shared use pavement here. The Parish Council therefore commends the alternative suggestions put forward by Mr Phillips and the City of Durham Trust to try and separate pedestrians from cyclists along this stretch and so improve cycle network on this key route. The necessary safety features set out above are not included in the current applications and therefore the Parish Council objected and it urges the applicant to revise the details of the scheme as set out above. Well, thank you Chair and thank you Committee. Thank you Councillor Ashby. Um, we now have uh, two objectors speaking. Um, I would have liked to have um, sorted this particular issue out prior to the meeting started, um, but we're going to have to do it now. Um, uh, Ms Grimes and uh, Mr Phillips, you each have two and a half minutes to speak. Now on my paperwork, we have Mr Phillips to speak first and, and Ms Grimes to speak second, but Mr uh, Phillips has indicated that he would prefer to speak second. Do you have any objection to that, uh, Ms Grimes? No, that's fine. Thank you very much. Are you happy with that, Mr Phillips? OK, thanks very much. OK, uh, Ms Grimes, you will have two and a half minutes to speak. When you have um, spoken for two minutes, um, the committee clerk will um, tell you that you have 30 seconds um, remaining. Uh, you will uh, use that to wind up. Can I ask at this point in time that due to some experiences in the past where, where um, people have gone past their time and have been reluctant to, to stop speaking, I am going to ask that the committee clerk actually uh, does cut you off at the allotted time. This is in the um, because of fairness. We we can't have sort of um, you you speaking longer uh, than maybe the people in favour and things like that. And and so I would ask for your cooperation in that particular issue. Can I hand over to you now, uh, Ms. Grimes? Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Committee. Um, we're here again with this development. Um, the objections raised by the residents of Highgate have been very eloquently put by Councillor Ashby. Our main concerns are the lack of prohibition on a right turn. Um, yes, Highgate does have the same left in and left out, um, but as Councillor Ashby has articulated, it doesn't happen. People do turn right in and out um, and it does create a safety hazard, a road safety hazard. And as I'm sure the police will be able to verify it has, ha it has caused major accidents at times. Um, our main concern is that work started on this site in the beginning of January without any plan of permission for this site. Officers of the council were made aware um, there was issues in the planning application. It said it was not for residence use, yet it was clearly stipulated in the very original planning application that this junction was to be only for residence use. Um, and Regardless of the fact that the developer knew that this, this junction did not have plan and permission, they continued to go ahead with it. Um, I don't know whether, whether um, officers are, and members are aware of that, but everyone was fully aware that this was continuing without plan and permission and the works, the diversions were in place and there was no plan and permission in place for it to happen. Um, I'm sure you'll appreciate this raises an awful lot of questions with the public because who's accountable and where does accountability begin and stop and who who actually is making the decisions. Um, we're entering a period of election and I'm sure you'll all appreciate openness and transparency is a key issue with the public um, and a key issue for everyone involved in, in this site. This site's been a very contentious site um, throughout the development and throughout planning. Um, and all everyone wants is openness and transparency. Um, seconds left. That's our main concern. Our main concern is that the right on junction, the people will turn right out of the junction and turn right into the junction and members of residents of Highgate want openness and transparency. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Grimes. 
And can I now uh, hand over to uh, Mr. Phillips, please? I've provided some slides, which I'm hoping Mr. Jones will be able to put up. Yeah, they should be coming up. Shall I start? Yes, please. The heart of the objection is that the junction design is inconvenient for pedestrians and unsafe for cyclists. And the proposal will prevent the widening of the current inadequate shared use cycle and footway. Currently, the shared path is up to three metres wide. Pedestrians feel unsafe here when cyclists pass them travelling fast downhill. The national guidance is clear that pedestrians and cyclists should be separated on such routes. Use of this guidance is mandated through the County Durham Plan Policy 21. Next slide, please. Um, widening the carriageway and um, adding white hatching and extra lines approaching the junction will be costly because of moving curbs and drainage. It will also confine the cycle and footway in a space no more than three metres wide, which cannot be widened again without further costly works. Our alternative proposal involves less realignment of curbs and provides for additional lanes by taking out the wasteful hatching and narrowing the lanes within the acceptable limits. The land take proposed by the applicant is instead used for a wide separated cycle and walking route. Uh, next slide, please. The applicant has consulted with the Highway Authority, so it is no surprise that the Highway Authority does not object. Um, they, there have been no obje objections of safety to our alternative, but the Highway Authority suggests that widening is required to address future vehicular demand. The Committee on Climate Change requires a 9% reduction in motor traffic by 2035 through reduced demand and switching to walking and cycling. Why is the Highway Authority planning for motor traffic growth but is so reluctant to create the conditions for many more people to use active travel? Next slide, please. The planning officer has summarised that the um, principle of the um, narrow uh, shared use pavement and the widening of the carriageway has been previously accepted. Um, but these permissions were granted before the current County Durham plan was put in place, before the city, Durham City Sustainable Transport Delivery Plan was put in place, and various other changes of policy, policy context, which you can see on this slide. Um, dealing with just one aspect, the effects of the cancellation of the Northern Relief Road in order to... 30 seconds. ...requiring the change to the junction, um, does not um, cover the situation adequately because the other matters should also be reviewed. I have no right to reply to the comments which will shortly be made by the highways officer. Uh, but as councillors, you should be asking your officers how a good quality cycling route can provide, be provided, which also keeps pedestrians safe, as this is vital on this road. On this road, if this application is approved, Time it will is be up, in the... Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Phillips, for that. Um, Henry. Would you like to come in and make any any uh, comments on what has been said so far, or would you rather wait until um, Mr. Mason has spoken for the um, for the for the applicant? I'm happy to um, make a few few general comments uh, now. Um, thank you, Chair, and then probably invite uh, John McGargill to uh, comment in a bit more detail on on some of those as well, Chair. Thank you. Um, First of all, in terms of the uh, concerns of the Parish Council, in particular regarding the uh, temporary uh, cycling pedestrian provision, I think the first point I would highlight is that that does not really form part of this, this planning application. Um, those temporary uh, arrangements in place for pedestrian cyclists, they go through a, an entirely separate street works license process granted by the Highway Authority. So um, I wouldn't want members to, to focus attention on that under this application because it, it doesn't form a part of, of the planning application proposals. Um, with regards to the concerns expressed about the development commencing uh, without uh, planning permission, um, I mean, ultimately, this has been handled in very much the same manner that, that all uh, retrospective applications or part retrospective applications really get handled, is that uh, any developer that commences work without uh, planning permission in place 
they do that at their own risk. Um, we ordinarily would hold any enforcement action in abeyance whilst the planning application is being processed and that's obviously what we're currently in the application being processed and we're here to uh, de determine it now um, and that holding enforcement action in abeyance is particularly the case in in, in an instance such as this where um, the key issue obviously all revolves around uh, highway safety the Highway Authority have deemed that the arrangements uh, are safe for the junction. So from a planning point of view, there's there's no expediency or, or certainly till this point, there's no expediency for, for any action from the planning authority. So that's the that's really the decision making processes in, in regard to that. Um, the other matter I'd just like to highlight is just the, the status of the um, footway, which is which is proposed under these proposals. And, and a bit of a background on the timeline of that. So not only was it accepted in principle that there would be, as a result of this access, the requirement to make alterations to the footway down from Gate Path. Um, it has actually previously been agreed in detail under a discharge of condition. It's, it's really shown on these drawings under this application um, as much as anything, because they are, they, they are essentially highways drawings and they are shown um, on the drawings from a planning point of view, this revised shared footway of the width that it is, it is proposed, it has really been through planning already and already got permission. It's, it's, not, it's not really for uh, revisitation. Um, and also I'd highlight in terms of the concerns raised that time has moved on in terms of the content of the County Durham plan and some of the references within that about uh, trying to explore as, as best as much um, um, you know, alternative cycling, pedestrian provision, etc. Um, once permission has been granted, once a discharge of condition has, has gone through the process, then really it's, it, I wouldn't have said it's really acceptable to then try and seek to um, uh, go back on that uh, simply because of any policy changes which have made. And, and furthermore, my report actually concludes that it, it, it accords with all the relevant guidance um, anyway. Um, so I think I've I've got all I'd, I'd want to, to raise on those points, Chair, there. Um, I'll defer to John, or if John would rather listen to, to, to Lee before he comes back, um, he, he can make that decision. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Henry. And John, uh, would you like to come in now, or, or would you rather wait? Chair, um, uh, I don't mind really. Um, I think possibly if I can respond to the uh, objectors, um, um, and let committee know the reasons why the highway authority consider the junction to be acceptable. Um, first of all, Chair, I'll point out that um, I think sometimes people think that we're just we're just highway engineers and we're just looking at how cars move. I actually share passion with um, Mr. Phillips about cycling, so I, you know I, I am uh, as interested as anyone to get a safe cycle network there. Uh, anyone who knows me will know, know I, I share that real passion. Uh, in this circumstance with this junction, as we've heard, the junction um, was approved on condition. Now, we as Highway Authority did have concerns about the traffic signal junction and whether we could actually implement that and uh, implement uh, that to operate um, with enough capacity in place. And that's why we asked for the condition to be placed um, <clears throat> as it is. Um, because of uh, demand that will be placed on that, that traffic signal junction, the junction would result in queuing of traffic from the junction into Milburn Gate. It would re result in queuing throughout the rest of the network through Durham. That has an impact not just upon pedestrians and cyclists, but also upon another sustainable transport mode, public transport users. So we've got to be very mindful and try to achieve a balance um, of what is right when we're considering these, these, these sort of issues. Um, just to address some of the points that have been have been raised, um, certainly with regards to the prohibition of right turn and uh, with regards to the design of the junction. Uh, I think first of all I'll come to Mr Ashby's, Ashby's point about um, pedestrian, temporary pedestrian signing. Temporary pedestrian signing um, was looked at and was approved by our network management officers. Um, that temporary pedestrian uh, signing does exist from Gordon House. Um, from Gordon House uh, 
area down um, from our gate path and also from um, Melbourne Gate Roundabout. So there is signing in place. Obviously, if you've passed that sign in, you take photographs within the, within the um, extent of that signing, then you'll show that there's no signing in place. That's simply because you've already passed the signing that was in place. And as I say, that's been approved by our uh, network, man network management officers. The whole, the whole temporary traffic management um, arrangement for the junction uh, has been assessed by our network management officers and has been permitted under license, as, as Henry has um, alluded to. Um, we believe the design will be safe. It's a, it's a standard priority junction. Uh, the difference between a standard priority junction and this junction is that it has a central island which is designed such that um, it encourages drivers to turn right. Of course, you know, in every highway situation, some drivers may well um, try to, 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 to avoid um, making the manoeuvre you try to encourage them to do so. And you know, I'm not saying no one will ever be, um, attempt to turn right from this junction. However, we've got an example across the road at um, Highgate um, where, where the sim similar um, arrangements are in place. We have looked at this uh, road traffic um, statistics, um, accident statistics for this, this stretch of highway. And um, despite what Ms Grimes has said about there being major accidents over the five years, there's been no major accidents um, within Framelgate Waterside, uh, Framelgate Pet. What there have been is some accidents where vehicles are proceeding um, downhill at speed and rear shunt type accidents or loss of control type, type accidents. And there's been three of those in the last five years. So we have to consider that when we consider this type of junction and, uh, and its design. Uh, Mr. Aspie referred to notices being posted. Those notices are actually legal signing approved by the Department for Transport. They are enforceable by the police. So if people are caught making a right turn, then clearly the police can take action all, all, all over that. Um, I think with regards to um, erection, erecting bollards in the middle of the carriageway to prevent people from making the right turn, of course we see bollards in other parts of the highway network. But the report from our highway uh, network manager is that the bollards that are in uh, as part of the temporary management system um, have actually been hit on a number of occasions and that puts operatives at risk. If they're hit, then the operatives have to go into the middle of the carriageway, a live carriageway, and reinstate them. So we prefer to monitor the situation as a highway authority. If we find that there is a real problem with, the, with these residents turning right, then of course we can take action. Um, but for the moment in time, we feel that by introducing some sort of physical feature will actually cause more of a problem than not. Um, I think with regards to Mr. Phillips um, uh, reporting that there, there is a, uh, um, a, a number of um, advice documents which, which tell you how to design the highway. Yes, they are. Some of those have been published since, like L LTN, uh, Local Transport Note 120, has been published since the approval of the um, the, the, the cycle, the shared cycle um, pedestrian route down from Elgate Pet. And we'd like to design as much as we possibly can um, cyclists into our network and, and pedestrians into our network. Of course, it's, there's got to be a balance. If you don't have the space, as we don't have in a lot of situations in Durham City, then, then, then clearly the designs that are recommended in, 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 uh, from the Department for Transport can't be fully achieved. It was suggested that lining could be removed, lanes uh, reduced, etc. Reducing lanes actually actually reduces capacity of the junction, Melbourne Gate Junction. And if we reduce lanes and reduce the capacity, we build queues. And if we build queues, we impact upon public transport. So again, it's a balance. You know, do we want public transport to run well? Do we want cyclists to have some provision? So it's a balance between them all. Um, I think that's it, Chair. If anyone has any particular questions, I'm quite happy to answer them. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that, uh, John. Um, let me see. Um, Councillor Wilkes has suggested that, that he has a question for you. Now, normally I, I wouldn't be inviting questions at this point because I don't want it to sort of enter into the discussion stage. But Mark, is this very pressing? 
that this that it happens now, or can it wait till later uh, on? It's, it's up to yourself, Chair. I wanted to just question the highways officer in relation to the uh, the proposals that uh, Mr. Phillips had put forward. So it's it's when you want to take that is entirely at your discretion. Yes, I I, I, I will take it, but at a later later stage because I, I I'd rather just um, keep sort of the, the the meeting in in the confines. Of, of what is normal, and I, I'm, I'm afraid that if everyone starts asking questions at this point, then we'll we'll find it difficult to progress uh, in an orderly fashion. So uh, thank you for your you, you accepting to to hold on to that one uh, till slightly later on in the meeting. Thanks very much. Um, okay, uh, we now have another speaker, and it's um, a, a, a Mr. Mason who is um, representing. The applicant, Toland Construction. Um, Mr. Mason, you have five minutes to speak. Once you have been speaking for four minutes, the, com the committee clerk will will give you a, a warning that you have one minute left, uh, where you take that time in order to to finish off. And as I said in the in the previous instance, I'd ask you that when, once you've reached the five minutes, if you can stop then, please, that would be very helpful. Thanks very much, Mr. Mason. Over to Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to just take the time to, to sort of back up what, what John McGargles um, just described to you there. Um, in terms of the design of the junction, we obviously started out as a development team with a, with what we would consider a fully functional junction. We, we The developer had a preference for it to be fully signalised and, and that was the point at which Toland picked up the design um, the design was stepped down for us to to complete and to get approval for. Um, I would say that that process has taken roughly 18 months and the interrogation from Durham County Highways officers has been rigorous um, to the point that we've now got a much simpler design um, and a safer design um, all around. Um, we looked at various different modelling to get to where we are um, and, um, and, and and looked at different design functions, but we were coming forward with the, with the, the design that we have currently. Um, that did look at uh, restricting access for the right turn once we'd got the traffic signals removed. Um, it was felt at the time that it introduced bollards and introduced a, a narrow um, island um, would present an obstacle to, to vehicles um, and would be unacceptable in, in, in safety terms. So that, that sort of takes, that sort of describes how we've come to, to, to the junction design that we're putting forward today. In terms of the, the decision to start on site early without having the condition discharged, if I could just touch on that. We, we didn't take it lightly. We had we we took the decision on the balance of a number of of of, um, of items. So we'd been through the, the, the coordination and consultation with the highways authority, um, and we got to a point where the junction was technically um, acceptable um, in highways terms. We'd also we also had the knowledge that the position and the um, inclusion of the junction within the Milvergate Gate site was acceptable, um, as Henry's alluded to um, in the original proposals. And more pressing than that, we wanted to take advantage of the, of the, of the reduced traffic due to the lockdown to start to start the work to minimise disruption on, on residents, um, on people working on the road, um, and and, and 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 the reduced traffic that's that's flown flown through and down how from over here at the present. Um, so it was nothing more sinister than that. In terms of the the temporary signage, as John's mentioned, we um, we did. I know it's not part of this application, but we did um, engage a third party specialist to design the signage arrangements and the temporary traffic management um, and. That was reviewed and approved under a separate license and th th these guys are specialists in in that type of work and um, Toland is a general contractor aren't so we, we do employ um, specialists to look at these things plan them out lay them out and then get the relevant licenses in place um 
in terms of of as I said the the the, the, the cycle, the shared cycle and, and pedestrian footwear, I think as, as John's mentioned before, keeping the the, the curb line um, essentially where it was and, and, and sort of widening the footpath out. I don't think in terms of, of vehicle safety and in, in terms of um, queuing traffic, um, it was felt that we needed to sweep the junction One in. And remaining. We haven't really um, changed or deviated away from that principle um, that was inherited in the original approval. So that the, 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 the sweeping in the curb lines remains, which is, is what we've, we've, we've started forming now. Um, yeah, that, that's that's all I've got to say. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, um, Mr. Mason. Um, OK, I'm, I'm going to pass over now to um, to the committee for debate. Um, Councillor Wilkes has already indicated that he wishes to speak. Um, but can I say here um, at this at this time that what we are doing um, and legal, if, if I'm overstepping the mark here, please tell me. But we are considering an application. Um, it is not um, up to us to look at alternatives, I don't believe, at this point in time. Uh, the application is in front of us and we need to decide whether it is acceptable or whether it isn't. So please keep that in mind. Thanks very much. Uh, can I call, call you in to speak, uh, Councillor Wilkes, please? Thank you, Chair. Yes, and if, if Henry could possibly put up the, um, the proposal from Mr Phillips, but before I discuss that. I just want to say something about this application um, because I recognise the concerns that residents had back when this original applications came through for this site. This development is going to be owned by Durham County Council. Toland consulted with Durham County Council that they were starting works on elements, as, he, as I've just been told, without planning permission. And I feel quite strongly, and this needs to be said, that this council should not authorise works without licensing or planning permission. It sends a message to residents that this council can break the rules and it's completely unacceptable. How many times do planning members of all political backgrounds say this is wrong when an applicant starts work on something without permission? So a simple statement to this council, don't do it again, it brings the council into disrepute. And to the developer, the same thing goes. You shouldn't be starting work without planning permission. Um, so, Chair, um, I've had my little rant there. I'll move on to actually looking at the, uh, the application itself. Um, within the new county plan, we've got various policies which are detailed in the report relating to green infrastructure. So policy 26, green infrastructure and that we should be maintaining and protecting and where possible, improving green infrastructure. I don't for a minute discount just how strongly our highways officer is pro cycling because I know how much cycling he does. Um, so I don't for a minute dispute that point at all, but I do want to just be clear in my mind and I appreciate what you said, Chair, about we're not looking at redesign and all the rest of it. I just want to be clear in my mind that the proposals that were put forward by the resident in relation to improving this junction, would they be a safer option in the view of the highways officer than what is currently on the table? Because the, the other concern that I have with this is that we've got various other policies. So policy six, that development shouldn't be prejudicial to the highway, development should have good access to sustainable modes of transport. Policy 21, these are all new policies from the county plan seeks to provide sustainable transport and amongst its advice seeks to ensure appropriate and well-designed routes for walking and cycling. Um, policy 29, sustainable development should contribute to healthy neighbourhoods and convenient access. And key point, policy 29, major development proposals should include paths which are safe and functional, prioritising the needs of both cyclists and pedestrians. I'm not 100% convinced that what's on the table at the moment does that. It concerns me greatly, as I've already said, that somebody's decided to go ahead with work when they haven't even got permission. So I just want some clarity as to whether or not what was proposed by Mr. Matthew, Miss, sorry, Mr. Phillips, I should say, would have been safer than what's on the table or not. Um, and I think the extra thing I'm concerned about is we don't have a ring road going in. 
Um, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be making sure that the city centre is more sustainable for cycling, for pedestrians. Um, and I have a worry that we're going to end up with a situation where it, it almost becomes impossible to cycle through Durham City. It's hard enough as it is now. We should have been making sure that it was as easy as possible when this development was, was, was being built and subsequently for cyclists, because ultimately we need to get to a point where there are fewer cars going through the city. Otherwise, for the next 10, 20 years, before we get rid of all of the um, polluting vehicles, we're going to find ourselves with, with even bigger air pollution problems in the city. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Wilkes. Um, John, would you like to come back on, on any of that, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, as we've heard from Henry and as I explained uh, previously, the shared use facility on Framwell Gate Pet has permission. It was pre pre previously granted permission. So what we're talking about here is the actual junction itself. And um, it, it, should that junction be changed, the design of that junction be changed um, to accommodate cyclists proceeding straight through the junction. It has been suggested, I think, by all three uh, objectors that a raised table should be included within the design. A raised table um, gives priority for pedestrians and cyclists to cross in front of vehicles turning into and out of the junction. Um, it keeps the footway at the same level throughout the throughout and across the junction. It means that cyclists don't have to stop. And, uh, and um, uh, pedestrians don't have to stop, but vehicles do have to stop when they're turning into the junction if a, if a cyclist or um, pedestrian is crossing in front of them. That's a good thing for cyclists. Um, I think I think uh, we, Mr Phillips would agree that that's how we should be designing the network to try to get priority for cyclists. However, it's not a safe thing in all situations. As I explained previously, one of the problems we have on Framwell Gate Peth is um, the, the accidents that have um, been recorded there are rear shunt type accidents. Vehicles coming down the hill and it is a steep gradient and running into the back of other vehicles who are sitting at the back of queues. In this circumstance, if a raised table was introduced, any vehicle making a left turn into the junction would need to stop. They would stop unexpectedly in front of vehicles who are coming down a steep gradient um, at speed. Now, I think there's more risk of reassurance accidents occurring by vehicles unexpectedly stopping when the vehicle is followed behind, expecting to turn left into the junction, than there is of cyclists um, needing to slow down to cross a junction. And I personally, um, consider that it would be safer for cyclists to, to have to slow down uh, to cross this, this particular junction, given that they could be travelling at high speeds um, coming down that steep gradient. Uh, so we have considered, considered what is the safest option, and I don't believe that a raised table is a safe option. Uh, we have considered what, what, what widths we can achieve uh, going um, downhill for pedestrians and cyclists adjacent to the development, and I believe we've got the best balance. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much, uh, John. Um, I'm going to pull in uh, Councillor Atkinson because Councillor Atkinson has been waiting for quite some time. Um, and then I will pull you in again, Councillor Wilkes, but I think it's only fair that um, Councillor Atkinson um, puts his points forward, please. Councillor Atkinson, thank you. Yes, Chair, thank you for that. Uh, this is Councillor Atkinson from Mayercliffe East. Um, I've listened to what Mr Wilkes is saying, and uh, I think we all have the same opinion when it comes to, to uh, starting without the planning permission and, and retrospective planning. But it goes on, it happens all the time. And Mr. Mason says, when you do this kind of thing, it's quite right, you do it at your own risk. That's a risk he's prepared to take, but he does do it at his own risk. With that in mind, I'm minded to say uh, yes to this proposal. And I'm also minded to say no. When I tried to sort the weight from the chaff, it appeared to me that <clears throat> what I got down to was 
is it safe? And the applicant and the highways are saying yes. And the objectors are saying, no, it isn't safe. So me as a planner, I get to sit in the middle and make the decision of one of them's right and one of them's wrong, uh, which of course I don't know. So I have to guess type of thing. Part of my guessing would be something that, um, that John said earlier on, uh, which would be take an action if problems occurs. Now I can guess in favor of this application. If I'm happy and convinced that we are monitoring the situation, if by his own risk, the um, applicant goes forward with this and gets permission to go forward with this. He takes the risk that at some point we are monitoring this situation and when we think it isn't safe and we say, whoa, we were wrong here, this isn't safe, right? We have to do something about it. The signal has to go in. If I can be convinced of the best effort will, will be guaranteed that we're going to do that, I can vote in favour. If, I, if I'm not guaranteed of that, I will be voting against because I don't think it, if we're not going to do anything and it's not safe, that's no good to me. OK, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Atkinson. Um, John, do you want to come in, in on that one? I mean, I, I'm sure that um, when you're planning these sorts of things, um, it, it isn't just with a, a pencil and a piece of paper. I'm sure that there is modelling done on it. Um, w would you like to maybe explain the process we go through, John? Chair, um, I think you, what you're referring to there is capacity modelling. There's no capacity issues, particularly at, at, the, at this junction. Um, the question for Councillor Atkinson of whether this is a safe junction or not a safe junction, the highways authority view um, is that this is a safe junction. Uh, so I, I have no doubt that the junction will operate operate safely. Um, the, there's no, there's no question about that. Um, we have had a safety audit undertaken. We've identified the risks, but with the appeal that they have been mitigated by the design. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much for that, John. We're really making you work for your money today, aren't we? OK, uh, Councillor Wilkes, would you like to come back in, please? Thanks, Chair, and apologies to Councillor Atkinson, because for some reason my link was breaking up all the way through as he was speaking, so I'm, I didn't fully get everything that was said. Um, so if he's if he said what I'm about to say, then I apologise. Um, the, the, uh, um, the highways officer seems to me to have suggested that the proposal that's there is necessary and safe because to do something else, and I'm sure that John will correct me on this, would not be safe because of the uh, the speed of traffic and the potential for rear end bumps, et cetera, et cetera. But this is a city centre location with a 40 mile an hour speed limit. I see no reason why you can't mitigate the risk of rear end shunts and of problems by reducing the speed limit along this stretch of road where most people are having to slow down coming up to a roundabout anyway. And by doing that, you then remove the, the impact that having uh, a raised platform so that it's a proper route straight through for cyclists and pedestrians. Um, if the traffic flow is going down to 20 or 30 mile an hour instead of 40, surely it's then safer. Why can't we put in, a t why can't we create a 20 mile an hour or a 30 mile an hour speed limit at this point, which will then make it safer to have the, the through uh, cycle and pedestrian uh, path? And, and it's 2021 and we're trying to actually improve the city to make sure that it's easier for cyclists and pedestrians. It's a perfectly sensible option on the table there. Um, and to simply say, well, the cars are going too fast means we can't do it, isn't a good enough answer. Thanks very much for that. Can I, can I put uh, uh, Claire Cluskin in, our legal um, advisor, please? Thanks, Chair. Yes, I requested to speak because I just wanted to urge members to um, focus on the application before the committee today. Um, it, it's important that we, we, we don't seek to really consider any alternatives at this stage. What, what members need to focus on is whether the proposal before the committee today is actually acceptable. If it is acceptable, then it should be approved. If it's not, then it should be refused. I also just wanted to make the point that a couple of members have touched upon as well about the retrospective nature of the application. 
Now, whilst that might be regrettable, um, it's not something that should be afforded any weight. It's not a material planning consideration and shouldn't be afforded any weight in the determination of the application. And that's all I wanted to add. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much uh, for that, uh, Chair. Chair. That, that was so, useful. Sorry, Chair. I, I lost, I lost uh, connection halfway through speaking. Um, so I don't know if you got everything that I said. Yeah. Um, and I just wanted to add on the point that was just made by the highways officer, if that's OK, Chair, that there are three options. We have the option to refuse, the option to approve and the option to defer. And I see no right reason why we couldn't ask for a deferral of this in order for people to look at whether or not there is a suitable option here of reducing the speed limit and improving this junction. I do believe we're allowed to do that, to ask for, for a deferral if, if we choose to. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I note that uh, Councillor John Clare would like to come in and speak. Over to you, John. Thank you, um, Chair, though um, I must say that um, uh, Claire Cuskin has um, uh, said a good deal of what I would have been starting to say. Um, <coughs> I do think it's very important uh, that we look at the application before us and that we look at the thing is, is this acceptable? Does this pass muster? Does it get over the necessary hurdle which makes it um, that we have to say yes to it? Um, as always, um, I would ask for uh, listeners um, uh, indulgence with me as I explain my thinking about what I've heard. Now, I've heard about complaints about the temporary uh, signage. Um, I'm afraid I regard this as irrelevant to the planning uh, application in front of us. What's gone on in the past about the temporary signage might indeed be unacceptable, but that is not the application before us. The only reason to uh, um, mention it, as far as I'm concerned, is to try and undermine the credibility of the applicant and to sort of get members thinking that this is a naughty applicant who need punishing. Um, I find similarly with um, the uh, mention that the applicant has gone ahead and started work without planning application. Now, this is um, absolutely common. We get a retrospect retrospective applications all the time. And the rule is quite simple for members that what we do is we are required to regard this as if it was a, um, a planning application with no history. And the only question before us is does this pass muster or not? And whether or not the work has been started or finished or whatever, that is what applies. I find the mention of elections absolutely outrageous and a clear attempt to influence the committee members. Um, the elections are utterly irrelevant and must be utterly irrelevant one way or the other to what's going on and uh, members must just put that out of their mind either way it's utterly unacceptable that that should be considered as um, a, a factor in this decision um every time mr phillips speaks i'm on his side i do think that he he he, he always comes forward with things and you see what his proposals are and you just think I wish they talked to Mr Phillips before they started and uh, that they make so much sense and the and there's not a person on this committee I don't think that will be unaware of the dangers of shared use um, uh, carriageways for pedestrians and cyclists and um, I'm going to, first of all, um, urge uh, Mr. Mason to just look at those proposals to see whether it would be possible to widen that carriageway to make it safer, because there's just no doubt about it. That's all the information coming through is that the new guidance is, is um, better and that um, uh, sort of uh, you need to try and make you need to try and separate these as far as possible give them as much room as possible 
However, I do have to say that it's just an urging. I don't think we can condition this. And sort of it's been made absolutely clear to us by the officers that planning permission for the cycling and walking route has already been given and we can't go back and start changing it because things have changed in the meantime. You'd never stop change going back changing stuff if you were to do that. So what is is and um, all we can do is to urge the um, urge Mr Mason to see what can be done about that and to pay Mr Phillips the um, respect that his uh, suggestions um, deserve. I see um, on the suggestion for a raised table across the junction um, and on the request um, for um, a, a barrier sort of I find Mr McGargill's argument to be uh, convincing and this is the answer to Mr uh, to Councillor Atkinson's point. I think that we can never make a junction totally safe. It will never be 100% safe because you can always get some idiot who's um, drunk and out of their mind or you can uh, sort of get a car which malfunctions. It can never be 100% safe. What we have to do is sort of we have to uh, design, a, um, see that the design is safe enough. And the suggestions of a raised platform would cause traffic coming down and turning left to slow more than without it. I think that's part of the argument for it. And therefore I accept the fact that doing so, whilst it might make it safer for cyclists and pedestrians, it would increase, as Mr McGargill has said, the likelihood of rear end shunts as people slow down more than the car behind them expected to. Um, as for a barrier in the middle of the road, um, Mr McGargill's absolutely right. As soon as you put a barrier there, you increase the likelihood that somebody's going to run into it. And so it's, uh, as Councillor Atkinson rightly said, it's a playoff of pros and cons. And on this, I am prepared to accept the word of the Highways Authority that this is safe enough. And I'm going to come back to my um, original point, Chair, and thank you for bearing with me. Sort of, we will never get the perfect junction. There'll always be somebody who comes along and says, well, I think that this could be better in this way. The, the thing that's before us today is not whether this is the perfect junction. The thing that's before us today is, is does this meet necessary planning regulations to be acceptable? That's the answer to Mr. Councillor Wilkes, who asks to defer us, because I think, um, I hope I will be right in saying that it is not going to be regarded as acceptable to defer this application if it is found, if it is thought that the application as is, is, per, is, is meets the acceptable level of acceptability. Now, we've been told by highways that it does, I think perfect uh, personally that it does and therefore chair I'm going to propose that we um, accept the officer's recommendation to approve this planning application. Thank you chair. Thank you councillor Clay and thank you for taking us through that in the, the logical way which you, you, you normally do that we've come accustomed to and cutting through all of the um, all, all of the sort of um, the, the fog which seems to be there for s some members. Uh, so I really appreciate uh, your doing that. Um, Councillor Wilkes, uh, is this something new that you're coming in with? Or, or well, is it just revisiting the same same thing as you've done chair, a couple of times already? I, I simply want to put forward a counter proposal that this application be deferred pending further discussion with the applicant, who in reality 
is the county council indirectly because we're the ones who are going to be paying for all this ultimately um, and let nobody who's listening to that me this meeting be uh, in any way deluded that this is not the county council who is responsible for this development and who will own it afterwards and who is therefore in a position to be able to look at this and reconsider it if it so wishes and for, for Councillor Clare to sit and for the highways officers to talk about, well, by slowing vehicles down, you're risking a rear end shunt. I think you'll find that every insurance company on the planet will blame the person who drives into the back of somebody if they drive into the back of somebody. You're in a city centre location and the reality is that we should be seeking to slow down traffic. We should be seeking to make sure that pedestrians and cyclists have priority. And I see no reason why we can't be looking at this and why this authority, when it owns the site, can't be looking at it and working with the developer to make sure that it's safe for the people who need to be safe here, which is somebody who doesn't have an airbag on the front of their bike or the front of their belly. OK, the person in the car driving down that road shouldn't have to drive and shouldn't be driving down at 40 miles an hour. There's an option here to reduce the speed limit, put in the proper um, crossing point here, making it safe for everybody. And if somebody drives into the back of somebody, well, they're obviously not watching the road properly, are they? I, I, I call for a deferral, Chair. If only you had a perfect world, Councillor Wilkes. OK, um, uh, Claire, I'll leave your guidance here. I noticed that Councillor Atkinson has second uh, Councillor Claire's proposal. Um, what um, Councillor Wilkes has done is asked for a, a proposed a deferral um, and we haven't had a seconder for that yet. Do we need to call for a seconder for that deferral um, option? I think it would be, I mean, we would normally just take the, the first um, proposal which has been seconded, but given that we, we are actually proposing a deferral, it, it would make little sense, I think, to proceed with a, a vote on, on approval without taking the deferral and asking for a seconder for that one. Thanks very much for that. So that's what I will do. I will ask if we have got a seconder for deferral, please. I do. Councillor Simpson here, uh, Councillor, I'll prepare second Mark's proposal. OK, so we've got um, Councillor Wilkes proposing a deferral uh, seconded by uh, Councillor Simpson. Uh, we've got Councillor Clare um, proposing acceptance of um, the, the, the planning officer's recommendations and seconded by uh, Councillor Atkinson. So Clare, do we go for the, um, on the vote on the deferral first? I would advise okay. that that would be appropriate, Chair, given the, the nature of the vote. Ordinarily it wouldn't be, but uh, I think in this instance it is appropriate. I appreciate that. Thanks very much, Claire. So Claire, would you like to now um, take the vote, please? And this is C for deferral. Certainly, Chair. So yes, I'll be taking a vote um, in alphabetical order of members and I'll be asking whether you're in favour or against deferral. So firstly, Councillor Atkinson, are you for or against deferral? Against. Thank you. Councillor Clare? Against. Thank you. Councillor Hawley? For. Thank you. Councillor Pounder? Against. Thank you. Councillor Shuttleworth? Against. Thank you. Councillor Simpson? For. Thank you. Councillor Wilkes? For. Chair, make that 4 3 against. Have I missed? Are there any members who have missed? No, Chair, that's, that, that, that motion fails. Thanks very much for that, uh, Claire. Uh, so we'll move straight on to the um, the motion for accepting uh, our planning officer's recommendations. Um, can you go through that process, please? Thank you, Chair. Yes, so this is a vote on both of the applications as set out at the start of the report. And I'll be taking a vote in favour of the officer's recommendation, which is to grant both applications um, and I'll be asking you if you're for or against. Again, Councillor Atkinson, please, are you for or against? I'll be for. Thank you, Councillor Clare. For. Thank you, Councillor Hawley. Against. Thank you. Councillor Pounder. For. Thank you, Councillor Shuttleworth. For. Thank you. And Councillor 
Will, uh, Councillor Simpson, sorry. Against. Thank you. And Councillor Wilkes. Against. Thank you. That's 4 3 in favour of granting the Planning Commission, Chair. Thanks very much for that, Claire. So um, I will announce that um, this um, application has been successful. Um, so I can I thank everyone for the time uh, they have spent and the effort they've put into this. Um, can I say thank you to the officers? Can I say thank you to council members and members of the public um, and, and Councillor Ashby too? Um, you don't you fall into two categories there, I suppose. So thanks very much for your time. Thank thank you for your contribution and please enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, there's um, any other business. I haven't been uh, informed of any other business, and so I take it there is no other business other than saying thank you to you all um, for uh, the support that you've given me uh, in, in this meeting and in previous meetings before. As I've said before, I won't be standing for re-election this year uh, or in May, and therefore I'd like to just take this opportunity of wishing everyone, uh, whether they are standing uh, for a council position again or not, uh, I wish you all of the best uh, and all of the best in whatever life has to bring you. Thanks very much and bye.